Okay guys, before I get started on the build video, I just wanted to go over a couple things because I noticed that a lot of new vapors um, are watching my videos and like trying these coils. Um, if you're brand new to vaping, I would not recommend starting with these coils. Um, start with some standard stuff. It takes a little bit of practice to have a good understanding of what's going on before you start just jumping into these lower ohm builds. Um, and batteries are really important. Uh, you don't know. I know for a lot of you that are watching this, this is old news and um, you're probably tired of hearing about it. Uh, but battery safety, you need high drain batteries. Samsung 25Rs, uh, these are really readily available. Um, I doubt they're counterfeited at this point just because they, are, uh, uh, they have a lot of supply of them and they're not expensive. Uh, Sony VTC4s, VTC5s are good batteries. I think they're pretty heavily counterfeited now though, so I don't even buy them anymore. And then the EFES 35 amps, uh, they don't perform really well below like uh, 0.14 ohms, but um, I'd, I've never heard of one like catching on fire or exploding or anything, so uh, they're okay battery too, but I've been using the Samsungs, I've been liking them a lot. All right, so on this build, uh, this build was like the Caterpillar Track coil uh, was coined by Sean. He's Blue Eyed Goon eighty three on Instagram. He's one of the best builders out there right now. Um, he does really insane builds. Uh, he's extremely motivated, and uh, and he he proved that this one was possible because uh, it's basically a multi strand fused Clapton that's been flattened with a hammer and. Um, in the past, I've only been able to get like three strands of 26 gauge inside of a fuse clapped and, and have them actually line up. And so when I started seeing him doing these builds with like 10 strands and 12 strands of 32 gauge, I was like, how the heck are you doing that? Um, and uh, you'll see in the build video, but it's basically the main thing to get, I would say, is a, is a jeweler's hammer which is what he recommended me get, and that um, that made all the difference in the world. I got it on eBay for like 10 bucks for a jeweler's hammer, and that seems to make the biggest difference, but um, these coils are really nice, uh, great vape, even with a single coil. Um, this one, I made two coils in the video, one's a 1 8 inch inner diameter, the other one's a 3 32nd inch. The 3 32nd inch came out to 0.18 ohms for a single coil, and I'd recommend that guy for like a, a mechanical mod. A wick in there, just because uh, it has a little bit lower resistance, cuts down on the ramp up time. And it's still a vape. Really great flavor off of this coil. Um, and it cools down the vapor a lot, uh, in a little bit of a different way than the Fuse Clapton does. does it more with just the amount of surface area that's on the coil itself. And so with a 1 8 inch inner diameter, it can handle even a single coil, it's 165 watts. So that's 6.5 volts that it's firing at. It handles it really nicely. You can hear the sizzling at the end there, and that's not because it's not keeping up with wicking. Um, that's because the wire itself, if you skip to the part in the video, like down in the timestamp down there, they have the, I have a section for cleaning the wire, and you'll see how water just runs across it. Because there's a lot of capillary channels inside and around the outside of the coil. Um, so it keeps up with wicking, even at stupid high wattages. It's still not a hot vape. So for a regulated box, I'd go with the 1 8 inch inner diameter. Um, just gives you more room to play with. And then if you're doing a mechanical, I mean 3 32nd, or like a 7 64th inch bit, will both work really well for the single coil uh, that I make in the video. I want to give a shout out to Local Vape. Um, not just for sending me the shirt, but also... Uh, we had the LV build off I was hosting on Instagram recently, and they donated like thousands of dollars worth of prizes, and it was probably the biggest turnout 
uh, for a build-up contest, probably in the history of vaping. And they're a really cool company. Um, the people who run it are awesome. And uh, it's a great company to support. So check out their website. And I think that's about it. Now let's go ahead and get started. I'll show some macro shots of these coils firing up. And then uh, I'll just get into the build video. Okay, so here's the coil from the build video. Um, and that's 30 gauge around the outside uh, with 10 strands of 30 gauge in parallel uh, on the inside. And that's firing at 5.5 volts, like 120 watts. It's a 0 0.26, 0 0.25 ohm coil. The reason I go with 30 gauge around the outside is because um, if you go with a thinner gauge, like 32 or smaller, uh, it's more likely to break for the wire to actually break when you're hammering it out. So that's why I went with this. It does have some pretty unique wicking properties, so I'll go ahead and put a little juice on here. Let it get cooled down real quick. And you can see the juice just run along that coil. It absorbs in like crazy evenly uh, compared to other coils. So you have a really cool, um, consistent, smooth vapor production even at the higher, higher wattages. The other option for the coil um, and it's what I'd recommend if you're using a mechanical mod or an unregulated device just because it's going to have lower ohms with a 332nd inch inner diameter and it's going to decrease the ramp up time a little bit if you're using a mechanical mod. 0.18 ohms and you can see why it's called the Caterpillar Track Coil. Uh, Caterpillar like the bulldozer, um, like tank, tank tread, just because as it's flattened out like that definitely has that appearance. Um, so this fires up quite a bit faster, uh, right around the, like the 4 volt range. And you can see in between the grooves in some of those Clapton portions, um, you can actually see through and see the wires all in parallel there. But yeah, I've been liking the coil. I like how it looks. Um, hope you enjoy the build video. Okay guys, we're going to need uh, quite a few things for this build video. Uh, you're going to need a flat metallic surface. I'm using this that I picked up at a craft store. I had a coupon, um, which I'm glad because it was like 30 bucks. What I usually use is just like an anvil that's built into my vise, but for the purposes of this video I got this just so it'll be easier to get on camera. You also need a hammer. Um, I'm using a jeweler's hammer. I think it might be called a chasing hammer. I'm not sure. I got it on eBay for like 10 bucks uh, from Waymill, I believe the seller was. But these are nice because they're rounded and totally smooth, so they're less likely to mar your wire when you're flattening it. Uh, you're also going to need, well, an optional item, but it helps out a lot, is a torch. I just have a standard propane torch. Um, obviously, be careful with these. You could easily burn the crap out of yourself. Or burn your house down accidentally, so careful with that. And if you have a torch, you're also going to need uh, two pieces, two sets of pliers. Um, and I'll show you what that's for later. You're going to need some clippers, of course, and your standard stuff, uh, like stuff to wrap the coil with. And also an atomizer with big post holes. This is a Mutation X, and actually the center post is big enough, but uh, for good measure, I drilled out those negative posts to 332nd size. To get started, um, what I did was I grabbed some 30 gauge wire off the spool. Um, I put one end into my vise. I pulled a whole big long length across the room and just tugged on it to straighten it out. Um, and then I cut it into sections. And this is 10 pieces right here, which is what we're going to do for the build video. Um, you just keep them as parallel as you can. They're going to overlap and stuff. That's okay. Um, I just grab it tightly and give it a little bit of a twist just with my hands here. I'm 
It's going to give the drill chuck something to hold on to. And just try to get it into the center of the drill chuck um, as good as you can. And then tighten it down. Now I have another piece of 30 gauge that I've prepared beforehand in the same exact way, uh, just to straighten it out. I tied one end, I put one end in the vise and then pulled on the other end, and I got a real long length here. Uh, you probably won't need more than uh, six to eight feet of it to get this claptoned up. And so just like any other clapton, I'm gonna stick this into the chuck of the drill. Any little place I can find and hopefully get it to catch. And at the beginning part, I just try to get get it going. So if it overlaps and stuff, I just let it happen. And the difference um, between doing a normal Clapton and doing with this many strands, uh, normally on a Clapton wire, I'll hold I'll hold a force on this core wire as I'm wrapping the Clapton around it. With this many strands, if you do that, it's just going to twist up completely. Um, and we want these to stay as straight as possible. So to do that, you just kind of alter the direction or the way that you um, Clapton wire up and just support the wire that's already been wrapped with your finger and then leave these core wires straight. Um, so just don't let them wrap up like after rubbing against your fingers. Oh, I'll kind of get it going and show you what I'm talking about. So you see how I'm holding uh, support with my index finger back here against the base of this wire that's already been um, wrapped up. And I made a little mistake here already, so I'm gonna pull it off. And using the same method, supporting that core wire that's already been uh, wrapped to put pressure on. Try to straighten this out and hopefully I can get it going again. Nope, I'm just going to leave that there and just try to move on. I'm going to leave the end uh, loose for the macro shot so I can show you what this looks like. Okay, we got the wire here. You can see the beginning part where I had it in the chuck of the drill. And then as you go, you see the imperfection I decided to just forget about. We'll just clip it off from there. And underneath here, you can actually see um, those wires pretty much in parallel. And there's some minor twisting that happens. Um, but for the most part, by supporting that, uh, the wire that's already been twisted, or already been wrapped up with your finger and then trying your best to avoid uh, having any pressure on that core wire all those core wires is going to prevent it from twisting too much because as we hammer this out it's going to actually straighten that wire um, 
and it kind of untwists and gets straightened as you hammer it. So uh, we'll go ahead and show you the end of the wire here. You can see for the most part those wires aren't really uh, twisted up too extremely in there. I'm going to do my best to get this on video here. Um, I'm just going to clip off that imperfection at the beginning. And I'll leave the end open like that so I can see uh, where the wires are going when I hammer it. So all I do is it's going to be, you don't want to just smash this really hard. Um, it's just like little control taps is the best way to do it. And like I noticed just doing like up and down, you'll get like a lot of uh, warping in the wire. And so what I've been doing is just kind of doing it at an angle like that as I hammer it. Uh, and regardless of what kind of hammer you're using, that seems to help quite a bit. Uh, reduce the imperfections in the wire. And also keep it from twisting around too much. And as you go, um, you'll see the flattening taking place. And then you can you can tell as you go where the spots are that need a little bit more hammering, the ones that aren't quite as flat. And it just takes some patience. And I'll show you a macro shot of what this looks like right now, and then we'll move on. Okay, so you can see the ends there. And surprisingly, it does a pretty good job of keeping those straight as you hammer it gradually in like that. Um, so it kind of forces them down straight. And even if they do twist a little bit in there, um, just having that even amount of pressure of flattening it um, keeps them all aligned pretty well. And so right there you can see um, to the point of the wire that is not yet flattened. And you can see these uneven portions here too, um, where the wire kind of dips in a little bit, where it wasn't uh, really flattened uniformly, and you can go back through and just uh, keep hammering in those spots until it looks nice and straight because you want it as straight as possible. And you just keep going. You can almost see the wire shifting as it gets to one of the parts portions that's a little bit twisted um, and it'll flip around and that's what's giving this wire that curve to it which is fine because that's where the torch is going to come in and we're going to straighten that back out after we're done flattening this out. And So the straighter you get those core wires um, at the beginning and the less twists you put in it the less of a curve you're going to have in your wire. Is that that, as that wire untwists as you're hammering it, it puts that um, torque in the wire. And you can see this portion here is that part in the wire that didn't get twisted up barely at all uh, while I was wrapping that clapton on it. So the straighter you can keep those while you're claptoning this, um, the more of a uniform result you're going to get at the end and the less uh, adjustment you'll have to do with the torch. Flip it over here. Let's get this end finished.
And then I just go back over it and kind of try to keep an eye on which parts need to be flattened more. And then just, um, just do real light taps until you have the result that you want. I actually straightened it out a little bit, All right, going back over it again. And now we're going to go ahead and torch this and straighten it out, and I'll show you uh, the next portion. Okay, obviously it's not a good idea to tape a blowtorch to your table, so don't do this. Usually I have this in an area um, that's not going to be near any sort of like structure that could burn or anything like that, and um, I wouldn't have my hands at this angle. I always have it po pointing away from me. Um, in a way that's not going to burn me or catch anything in my house on fire. So make sure that if you do have a torch, hopefully it's one of those handheld butane torches. Um, it's worked just fine. Okay, so what you want to do is just grab the wire um, like one inch at a time and just start heating it up. And you can just kind of pull on it gently and then let it cool down while keeping it as straight as you can. And as it cools down, that hardens it up. Grab another portion. Don't want to get it too hot or the wire will melt. Um, but just hot enough to where you can adjust that and try to get it a little straighter. You just move up the wire, little by little, until the whole thing is straightened out. And be careful because uh, this wire is going to stay hot for quite some time. Um, so don't set it down on anything that's going to get burnt, and don't touch it with your hands. Same goes with those pliers, they're going to be extremely hot for a long time, so let them cool down somewhere where uh, they're going to be safe, and then move on to the next portion. So here's what you should be basically looking at here, and um, this is a good time to check to make sure if that wire is going to fit through your post holes or not, um, and also just check for imperfections or unevenness in the wire, because uh, if you have too drastic of an imperfection, it can cause a hot spot in the wire just where there's not a solid connection um, or not a steady like consistent connection in the wire and you'll notice like this side is pretty um, marred up if I turn it over it's gonna be the side that I actually was using that chrome plated hammer on and it gets it really shiny and so I don't know personally I like to put that shiny side to the outside so you can see it um, but yeah, there's some more imperfections, and so uh, I also like to go back over again after torching it straightened um, and just hammer it one more time just to get all of the imperfections out. 
or get it as even as possible. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that again. It's not as even as I want it to be as far as um, how flat the wire is and how evenly it's flattened. I'll go back over it again after I torch it. Um, just to get those last little imperfections out. Because not just for aesthetics, like it's going to look a lot nicer if it's even, but also because it's less likely to have hot spots internally in the wire. Um, and it's just going to perform better the more even it is. So all I'm going to do is go back through um, and hammer this out, see if I can't get it more even. And then I'll show you some macro shots of that after torching it again. And I just continue that process. You don't want to do it too many times because um, you're going to get... Uh, the wire will become brittle if you do it too many times. But it's also a good time to check your posts. See if make sure that this wire is still going to fit through it. And it is, and I'm just going to make it um, basically as flat as I can um, while still allowing it to fit through the posts. And when you're finished um, and you got it to a point where you're satisfied with, this should be basically what you're looking at. Um, and here's where you can really tell why Sean wanted to call it uh, the Caterpillar track coil. Because it really does look like uh, tank tread tracks. And you'll still see there are some imperfections left in this, uh, but that's not a huge deal. Um, when you wrap it up in a coil, it's going to look great. Uh, but the next thing that I always do after I get it to the point that I want it is to wash it off. Just because there's going to be almost like a powder created uh, from hammering the wire like that. And so there's going to be that powdery residue, and I like to wash that off before I start vaping it. So, And I have something I want to show you too uh, while I'm washing it off, so I'll move us into uh, over to the sink. I always like to rinse my wire off really well. I'll actually hit it with dish soap. Not everybody is uh, comfortable using dish soap to clean their wire because they have to vape it afterwards. Uh, but as long as you rinse it off really, really well, I have never noticed any sort of flavor or weird uh, taste from it. It's not guaranteed that there's not some sort of soapy chemical left on it, but um, I feel a little bit better. I think that does a better job of uh, getting all of the possible metallic particles off of the wire. Um, but you'll notice on this wire that it just runs off like that. It wicks in that way better than spiral wire, uh, better than a zipper coil. I mean, there's not many wires that's going to act like that. And I think it's um, like a two-part uh, process or reason. It's because that uh, it creates capillary, like horizontal capillary channels um, for the water to continue flowing across. And then also internally, once you have the coil wrapped, um, you have all of those aligned uh, smaller internal wires um, creating juice channels as well. I'm not sure how much of the juice can actually get in down inside of those internal wires, but I'm guessing it's probably um, a significant amount. So it's almost like a crisscross pattern, like a stainless steel mesh. So the wick itself has some pretty interesting wicking properties. Um, but let's go ahead and wrap up the coil. Okay, so we got it cleaned up, and um, it's a good idea to keep the atomizer nearby while you're doing this, just to make sure you don't make too wide of a coil. I'm thinking four wraps is probably going to be as much as we're going to be able to fit in there. Um, for this one, I'm using a larger diameter screwdriver than I normally use, uh, just because we got ten strands in there. It's going to be pretty low resistance. I'm going with 1 8 inch um, inner diameter here uh, for this size is 1 8 inch equivalent. So just like anything else, start wrapping the coil. And you're going to have to get the angle right as you go around here. Um, and so just kind of pull it, once you get one wrap, pull it over kind of close just so it's touching the other portion and keep as much pressure on this wire as you can so you can get it nice and tight.
see what we're looking at here. Yep, and that basically matches up for wraps there. Hopefully this portion is going to fit through. Posts. I think I can pull it through. Okay, I found the best way to do this is to mount this coil um, so that the the wrap that comes up and around is going through the negative post because in order to get this cleanly in there you'll notice how these wires are kind of jetting out to the sides and so the cleanest way to do this um, is to get it mounted in there and then give it an angle and kind of tilt it like that and so having it tilted up like that it's a lot easier to wick if we got this whole for coming upwards rather than trying to do this side um, pointed down and then it cuts off the wick over there um, so you're not able to wrap it back in and through the well and that's why I'm doing that um, let's go ahead and get this guy in and lift the lead kind of long uh, just so I'd be able to get this guy through there fits right in thankfully and so I'm going to grab some pliers, and all I'm going to do is pull this through, on both sides, and once I have the center post, uh, the coil at the center post pretty close to the center post. What I do is I just go ahead and tighten that guy down first. And you definitely want to get this guy nice and tight. And then I kind of start adjusting this one upward. And then once I have it at the angle that I want, just check how much slack you have. I'm going to pull a little bit of that slack out by just tugging on the wire and the negative post. And then I'm going to tighten that down. And you just have to kind of eyeball it. Try your best to get the right amount of wire in here. that point it's just a matter of adjusting it clip this guy off and this one Bend that up and out of the way. And it's just like any other coil, we just um, start firing it up.
And then if you have a part um, like this top portion here that's not wanting to line up with you, with the other part of the coil, you can actually grab some pliers and basically force it into place. Let's throw this on the IPv3 and see what it ohms out at. Alright, so it's ohming out right at 0 0.26 ohms for the single coil. Um, and I got it firing at 67 watts right at 4.2, just under 4.2 volts. Um, there's a little bit of ramp up time on this thing. So uh, for a single coil, um, I'm going to actually try another one. I'm going to do it on a 330 seconds uh, drill bit just to see what it ohms out at. And then we'll know the ohms of this coil on two different sizes. This is the 1 8th, came out to 0 0.25, 0 0.26 area. And then I'm gonna try it on a 3 seconds inch, um, and we'll see where that goes. Okay, on the 3 seconds uh, drill bit size, we're looking at 0 0.19 ohms for a single coil, um, which at 4.2 volts lights up quite a bit quicker. It's probably more my cup of tea uh, for a single coil. Um, but at the beginning, you should have seen the performance for both of these. So. That's the difference in size and looks is the 1 8th compared to the 3 32nd. Um, so yeah, I mean, depending on what size drill bit you use, you could get different ohms coming out of this thing. Um, if you're using a regulated device like IPv3 or Segeli 150 watt, um, it's not going to matter really which size you go with because you could just change the wattage up and down. But let me look these guys up for you. And for these 1 8 inch uh, inner diameter coils, I like to use a lot of wick compared to what I normally would use. Um, just because it's important to get full contact with that coil in the wick. And so it's always um, a struggle for me because I usually do the 3 seconds inch sizes. Right down and through. Grab it and pull it through. And try your best not to um, adjust that coil too much while you're pulling the wick through. Just because if it gets pulled too uh, too intensely, what can happen is that those wires can get crossed and cause those hot spots to come back. But your wick's already in there, so you wouldn't really uh, be able to tell, except that it's going to kind of hurt your throat when you're vaping. So sometimes if your coils um, lighten up evenly and then after wicking it, when you're vaping it, it seems to be getting hot spots on the coil itself. Uh, it's usually caused just by when you're putting your wick in, um, it adjusted the coil and altered where it's positioned. The only thing here is just try to get some like a pocket of air in there. I'm just gonna snip this off a little bit more. You just want full airflow underneath and around the entire coil. Let's get rid of some of that cotton and there we go. So leave some space for air to travel in through and Cool the whole coil down. 